exploitation and everyone who has made it to our presentation today. Um, thank you, everyone. This is a going to be our first, um, this is going to be the introduction or um, the first meeting that we're going to have in the web development um, team. So um, in the Microsoft Langston Ambassadors, we have the web development track. And so this is the first series of meetings that we're going to be having. Um, and our topic um, today is domain driven design. So we're going to discuss what domain driven design is. We're going to see how we can use domain driven design in our projects. We're going to see the advantages of using object oriented principles within the design of our applications. We're going to check the advantages of using and writing clean code. So we're going to discuss the clean architecture. We're going to discuss how to lay out our dependencies. We're going to discuss how to um, we're going to discuss the solid principles and we're going to discuss how all these are intertwined in creating efficient, scalable software. And at the end of the uh, presentation, at the end of this presentation, we're going to build an API, an authentication API that I use in all my projects. So whenever you get um, a project or an application or someone who approaches you to do something for him, you can use this module um, in the coming days to come and you can deploy it as a container and use it as a service within your login um, um, applications um, wherever. And without much further ado, let's get started. So what is domain driven design? So domain driven design was developed in the ancient times. So times before microlithic architectures by Eric Evans and surprise, surprise, um, domain driven design is actually a perfect overlay in our microlithic architecture. So it was written for the monolith architectures, but it works great with the microlithic architectures. So domain driven design advocates for modeling based on the reality of business as relevant to your use cases. So domain driven design, as we're going to see, is we lay out our business um, with, we just look for our business and we get the core business domain and that's what feeds our application. So we separate the core business domain from other, um, I would say, code of our application. So at the center of our application, we, are, we only have the business model that is supposed to work at that. Um, and um, without much further ado, let's continue. So, uh, oops. Yeah, so in the context of building applications, domain driven design talks about problems such as domains. Yeah, as I have developed applications and I have seen that um, domain happens to quickly become out of uh, scope whenever you're trying to create your applications and you have so much code to maintain that does all this stuff. And if you try to develop one thing, everything just breaks. Um, and this is, I would say, procedural based applications. So I have been writing mostly such kind of applications, which led me to sort of take a read through these books and read some more tutorials, which I have referenced at the end of this presentation, which is going to be open for everyone at the end of the discussion. It describes independent problems such as areas. It, de it describes independent problem areas as bounded context whereby each bounded context correlates to a microservice and emphasizes a common language to talk about these problems. Now, where is a domain? A domain can be defined as a specific sphere of activity or knowledge that defines a set of common requirements, terminology and functionality on which the application logic works to solve a problem. So in essence, is the domain, a domain is what your application is working towards. So what your if you're, for example, you are creating an e-commerce application, your domain is going to be the, 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 I would say the retail buy and selling, like the end user, um, how to make the end user um, transactions better. So you would do things like CRM, um, delivery emails, um, and those kind of things are supposed to be um, shipping, payment, they're supposed to be at the core of your application. Developers have to steep themselves in the domain to build up knowledge of the business. They must hone their modeling skills and master domain design. Yeah. Now um, I'm re I'm working on a restaurant application, and I had to learn completely what happens in a restaurant from the POS guy to the chef, all the way to the administration guys in the office, and um, to the stakeholders. So all that pipeline, you need to know how everything works, the line of management. You need to know how certain um, um, things are done. So, for example, if it's someone who's redeeming points, 
So what's the required uh, procedure? How does that go? In a restaurant, when someone is doing an order within the restaurant, how does that go? So how long does the meal take? Can you time it from your application or from the APIs? Such things are what we're trying to see if you can by immersing yourself directly into the business. There are design techniques that can bring order to a sprawling software application. Cultivation of these skills makes a developer much more valuable even in an initially unfamiliar domain. Exactly. Now that's what I was going to say. Now, um, you, you, can, you, can, you, you don't necessarily have to be an expert, for example, in the restaurant field or in the education field, but you can use design techniques to see how you can create something um, from an application. Um, Robert Martins, I think it was Evans, Eric Evans or Von, Von someone who wrote a book about domain driven design said that he was write, writing an application and they needed to do something with microchips and he's never done anything with microchips. So he just had to understand the whole flow. He was explained to the whole flow of the application and use these design techniques to slowly create an application that did what was required of them without having to know what a microchip does or all that neat stuff. So why domain-driven design? In a traditional model view controller application architecture, the M layer holds all the business logic, but doesn't provide clear rules on how to maintain proper responsibility boundaries, since there is always a risk of logic and responsibility leakage between components. And this is true. So I had written a, a Node.js application. Actually, even my personal website is written in a Node.js. Yes. And it's just simple um, layered uh, functions in Node.js. Yes. And when, when, when you're growing your application, you need to have an admin, for example, a super user, staff, clients, and all that tends to leak some stuff into the um, application for other components. And it becomes very tricky and I would say mind boggling to try and decipher or solve the leakages. This makes maintainability and stability tricker. Yeah, actually, the stability of your application is actually at risk because now if you do any change in one model, you have to, or controller, you have to come back and ensure that this doesn't take place in the controller and you need to have to do some sort of, you have to start all over again. Now, naming also has always been one of the most difficult challenges software engineers face. Now, we should be clear enough for other developers to understand our intentions in the code while using appropriate naming choices that can facilitate a conversation with business stakeholders. Now, for example, domain-driven design has given us a way to name our variables, our application uh, directories, and um, that's also done by clean architecture, um, also a way how to name everything so that even when you give up your application to other developers, they know exactly what's going on within your application. And um, communication with business experts, requirements gathering, and consensus between technical and non-technical teams to properly design and implement a system that solves a business pro problem is a constant iterative process where things can easily get misinterpreted and ultimately derail the project from its original goals. Now, there are ever-changing principles in software design that you always have to account for. For example, um, the non-technical team could come and tell you, hey, so we need to do this because we didn't tell you guys that in order for ABCD to be done, um, this has to be done. So we need to get, for example, before an order is signed, the manager has to approve it. So um, can you factor that into the application? And so that brings in a whole redesign of the application. And you have to start again checking whether everything can be solved. And um, domain-driven design helps us to put up our code in such a way that um, we can keep up with the ever-changing business demands because the business domain is always changing because we always have to keep up with competitors out there and we always have to give our customer the best. So that doesn't mean that the development is going to stop. No, domain-driven design can help us solve this. So what does domain-driven design help us solve? So domain-driven design helps us uh, it attempts to solve these challenges. It reconciles technical and untechnical forces that collide in software development. Just like I said, um, we can have proper design techniques to know. For example, whenever we start to create our application, um, this is always, for example, the ordering is always in a different domain. The restaurant part is in a different domain. The authentication bit is in a different domain. And we are just calling, um, for example, interfaces 
um, that call lower level modules that keep our application moving without leaking any state or information to other properties, for example, like the order, which doesn't need to know about the authentication parts. So um, yeah, let's continue. Um, it helps to solve, DDD helps to solve proposing a set of practices and patterns that facilitate building a successful system. So that is very important. So there are practices and patterns that you can use within your application, which was said that are like design techniques you can use to continually iterate and keep up with the ever-changing domains for your system. Let's move on. So domain-driven design and clean architecture. So how do they intertwine? While domain-driven design focuses on naming patterns, streamlining an agile development environment, and separating domain code from application infrastructure, it is a software design principle and it can only be deemed effective by following architectural coding patterns. Okay, what does that mean? That's a lot to swallow. So domain driven design focuses on naming patterns. So what does that mean? It helps us focus on things like naming patterns in creating an agile development environment whereby we can always have a continual iterative process between the non-technical team and the technical team and always deliver an end product. It can help us separate domain code from application infrastructure. Infrastructure, just like I said, the ordering module doesn't need to know whether the mongoose or the MySQL database was connected. All these have to be completely separate and they do not have to know what's working. It should be a low, a high level running component or a low level module. Um, what does this mean? Clean architecture defines, now what is clean architecture? So clean architecture defines a way of designing the whole structure of the system with the domain core being isolated in separate modules. So clean architecture defines a way of how we can create our applications, um, how we can, how we should arrange our code. So for example, if we have things like a use case, we could push it, put it differently. We should have infrastructure code differently, infrastructure code being the one that calls maybe the API. We're gonna see this all in practice. Uh, it defines a way the whole system with the domain core being isolated in separate modules. And you're gonna also have your domain core services in a completely different maybe folder called services. And that's gonna be essentially what you want your application to do. That's gonna be the domain part of that specific part of your application. It is a software design philosophy that separates the elements of a design into ring levels. So whereby it's like an onion. So the core business domain is at the center part and all the other parts are like layers. Um, the main rule of clean architecture is that code dependencies can only move to the outer levels inward and not. So um, if you have the out there, for example, as which you're gonna implement, the sign in, the sign out use case can only check if the token is, is valid, for example. So how does it check if the token is valid? It should check it by going backwards. So um, for, for, from the business domain, everything should be moving outwards. So there should be no code go that is um, going back. For example, the domain can be called forwards, but um, it cannot be called backwards. You're gonna see this. I have an, uh, 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 what's it called? A diagram at the end of the presentation to explain all this while we have finished um, also about solid principles. So here is the book by Uncle Bob. So he's also famously known as Uncle Bob, but his name is Robert C. Martins. And he wrote um, about clean architecture. I'm going to recommend this book to anyone who wants to write clean code. He has a lot of stuff that can help you read um, some pseudocode to help you think about around everything, how everything works. And yeah, he is a pretty, he's a pretty cool guy. He was way ahead of his time. Solid principles. Excuse me. What are solid principles? So Robert C. Martin the writer of the clean code architecture also proposed uh, principles that are going to help developers create efficient um, software. Um, yeah, create efficient, efficient, scalable software. And this was written in 2000, yeah, you wouldn't imagine. So Robert C. Martin described the solid principles as the following. So to create understandable, readable, and testable code that many developers can collaboratively work on. Let's continue. Now, um, Uncle Bob described the solid principles as the following. Now, here's where things get a little bit um, chunky. 
Um, I have some notes here. Um, just a minute. I have some notes here I need to refer to. Yeah, there we go. I hope they still they're still there. Oh no. <laughs> anyway. A anyway, yeah, we can just keep it like this. Let me just zoom in. Uh, when I zoom in, it becomes even smaller. Anyway. So, or I can just bring this, copy it just a minute. I have some keynotes here that I needed to. To refer to and explain more about the solid principles. There we go. OK, now let's go back. Yep. OK, so solid principles. Um, so our first solid principle is single responsibility principle. And this is actually very self-explanatory. And what does single responsibility mean? So he described a single responsibility principle as a class should do one thing, and therefore it should have a single reason to change. So for example, um, in the code that we're going to be writing, let me just sort of show you guys the end of what we're going to be writing, just as a point of understanding. So when we are going to be having a code for signing in and signing out, and let me just open it up so to gain some, I would say some, some reference or to understand properly what we're doing. With API, API, source authentication, open in terminal. Yeah, so this is the final project that we're going to be working on. So here it says that a class should have one. Um, Why do we have classes in the repository? We are going to have a class. Yeah. Yeah, so it says a class should do one thing and one thing only. Therefore, it should have only one reason to change. So this is the authentication repository. So we're going to discuss more about how we name things um, as we continue coding, because I try to put it in a presentation, but it was it was quickly becoming even confusing for me. And so here we have a class that implements the I authentication repository, which is an interface, which is also part of the uh, solid principles. Um, and so here we can see the only job that um, the auth repository does is find, finding a user and adding a user. And that's all it does. And if you check our interface, I didn't hit open up, but it's still initializing. Anyway, uh, let's just wait for that to load. So the class there was only doing one thing and supposed to do only one thing. And the auth repository shouldn't do what it should do in the password encryption. The password encryption service should be different. And password encryption should be the core domain of the authentication module. So this is how we're going to build out and lay out our application using all these three principles to create efficient software. Number two, open closed principle. Um, a module should be open for extension, but closed for modification. OCP simply means we should write our modules so that they can be extended without requiring them to be modified. I don't know if that is something that can be understood. So it's a simple um, yet kind of mind boggling, um, I would say concept. And in other words, what it means is we want to be able to change what the modules do without changing the source code of the modules. And here, indeed, abstraction is the key. 
And by using these techniques, we confirm to the OCP, the object, the open closed principle. We can create modules that are extensible without being changed. This means that with a little forethought, we can add new features to existing code without changing the existing code and only by adding new code. What does this mean? So for example, here, I hope it's already done. Yeah, so here we can see we're only using this interface for our authentication repository. This means whenever we want to create something new, we'll only come, for example, if we want to delete users, we can only come and add delete. And we can just pass in maybe the ID or the email. We can just pass in the ID, which is going to be a string. And we're going to return um, a promise. Nope. I don't think we're gonna, re we should, should we return anything? Anyway, I don't know. Yeah, for example, if we wanna return a user, I don't think we're gonna need to return anything. Yeah, so this is what we're gonna do. And in our authentication repository, as you can see now, we have to in incorrectly implement the auth repository and we're missing a type. So we should just implement the type and create now what the type um, class is supposed to do. So, but anyway, we're not gonna be needing that. That's just uh, an example I was showing. And moving on, list curve substitution principle. Subclasses should be substitutable for their base classes. What does this mean? I had a very difficult time um, understanding what the list curve sub substitution principle was. And so I decided to give it a bit of a Google. I even went as far as looking for the, uh, the main Uncle Bob uh, paper. And from his original paper was where I got his definition. And he said subclasses should be substitutable for their base classes. And that just made so much sense. The principle was coined by Baba Liskov in her work regarding data abstraction and type theory. It also derives from the concept of design by contract by Bertrand Mayer. The concept is derived classes should be substitutable for their base classes. That is, a user of a base class should continue to function properly if a derivative of that base class is passed to it. Um, I don't know if that made sense. A user a derived classes should be substitutable for their base classes. That is, a user of a base class should continue to function properly if a derivative of that base class is passed to it. I think what this means is if you call the, the base class, it should work the same way just as calling the subclass. And um, that's what it means. Subclasses should be substitutable for their base classes. Yeah, I think that's how I understood it. And moving on. Um, so here we did to solid S O L I D. Also, we did do some repetition there. Apologies for that. So the third one is so S O L I I the fourth one interface segregation principles. So what does what does interface segregation principle? Not principles, apologies, I'm going to correct that. Many client specific interfaces are better than one general purpose interface. I think that makes sense. So many client specific interfaces are better than one general purpose interface. So if you check the application that we write, we have um, some. I think we do have a couple of interface classes. Hmm. Apparently we don't. Yes, we do. Yeah, we have a, a bunch of um, interface classes to help us um, with um, creating the base, for example, for the services that are going to be used in the domain or in the um, data um, services. So, for example, here we have the password service where we, we hash the password. Then we compare the password that is hashed or, for example, that the user has keyed in. And here we have the token service for encoding and decoding and... Why is this an error? Uh, we're going to talk about this more. I'm going to read that why that is causing the error before we get into our next session. Here's a token store where we store our tokens and we save our tokens. And yeah. Yeah, OK. And OK, I think we can just continue. Mm -hmm. And what does interface segregation principle mean? Um, uh, yeah, it just means the same thing that we just discussed. Um, we can have an interface for doing this thing and an interface that does this thing. 
which helps separate code logic. And whenever there's an error, you can be able to go to specifically where there's a problem and that interface and that class, and you can be able to just see what is going on over there. Dependency inversion principle. Depend upon abstractions. Do not depend upon concretions. So if the open close principle states the goal of object oriented architecture, the dependency inversion principle states the primary mechanism. So what does that mean? Open close principle states the goal of object oriented architecture, which means that you can have open classes that are closed for modification, that are closed, yeah, closed for modification, but open for extension within other classes. And so that's the, the main goal of a completely object oriented um, application. And in dependency, dependency inversion principle states the primary mechanism of achieving the open closed principle of an object oriented architecture. So dependency inversion is a strategy of depending upon interfaces or abstract functions and classes rather than upon concrete functions and classes. This principle is the enabling force behind component design, COM, COB, CORBA, and EJB among others. So what does this mean? Let me see if we have used somewhere um, dependency. I think, uh, I think uh, that's an example. Let me just see. Uh -huh. Yep, so as you can see here, we have uh, the sign in use case class, which has uh, functions like execute, and email login and OAuth login. So what we do is we in in our auth repository, we call the whole class. Um, is it here? Is it in the auth repository? No, it's in the auth controller. In our auth controller, we pass in the use case into our constructor, and we use it um, here, and we pass in the user that was created and chain in the 10 block because it was an async asynchronous uh, function. So this is, I, th I think this is what uh, dependency inversion means, whereby we depend upon abstractions and not concretions. And now here is the neat stuff. So um, let's go back to our application. So um, this is a diagram showing um, the, so execute. Anyway, mm, there's a problem here. Yeah. So execute doesn't take the complete user, but it takes um, all the individual. So instead of creating this the user here, we should just pass in all these params. Let me see. Just fix this. Um, and just return this here. I think it's something similar to that, but anyway, we're gonna work. I'm gonna work on this before we meet next time. Yeah, anyway, so here is the architecture, the clean architecture diagram as presented by Uncle Bob on his blog. And so what does this mean? You can see code can only go backwards and cannot go forwards. So for example, entities cannot check what use cases have. No, use cases can only go to where entities have. Use cases cannot go and check controllers. No, controllers can only check use cases and device can only make requests to the controllers, which makes a request to the use case, which goes to the business um, enterprise business rules, which defines the request and then gives back information to go back to the other side. So this is essentially what um, goes on. So the controller passes in the use case into the input port. The use case interactor interacts with the input, the use case output port, and then to the presenter. And that's how the control goes, for example, in a clean architecture application. So um, with that in mind, let's just check our application. So within our application here, we can see that we have, uh, we are using uh, TypeScript. Um, as mentioned at the beginning of at the introduction of our application. And we can see how we have layered our application. Um, we're gonna have a, a markdown that I saw on GitHub that was uh, that was very 
that was actually very of help, that was going to help us understand how we are going to lay out all our principles. And I think I'm going to just tag that at the end of the at the end of the presentation. And we're going to use that as our official uh, read me just to understand how everything is laid out. We're going to build, of course, everything together just so that you don't feel left out or in case you need to a point of reference, you can just ask me. So we can see here the yellow part is the enterprise business rules. The red part is the application business rules. The green part is the interface, which works with presentation, the gateways and the frameworks and the drivers being the last part, whereby it's the UI making a request to the uh, controllers or the presenters, which makes a request to the use cases, which goes to the enterprise business domain and gives back information. And so here is the data. So what data is, this is gonna be the end of the application, but we're gonna build everything from scratch. So what, what does data have? So data has everything related with data. Um, so here we have uh, a user model. So here we create the interface for the user model. And here again, we create the user schema. We are gonna use the interface um, later. And then here we create the, the repository. Now, what does the repository do? It implements the authentication repository. And so this repository is just the base class that has the methods that are gonna be implemented in the class. Just sim simple OOP um, at work here. So it's just find, which takes an email and returns a promise of type user. And this one adds a user and then passes an email of uh, type string. And then here um, we call in our default class of, um, and we, we, pass, we pass in the client, which is Mongoose, to the constructor, and then which is going to be available in the whole class. And then now um, public async. So when we find our user, we're going to um, query the database using the user model and um, using the mongoose uh, data and then we are going to wait for users to find one so you can just see simple um, application so here we have the services so in an authentication module what are the core business application services so you just want to so for example you want to validate tokens and invalidate tokens you want to create uh, json web tokens and you want to hash your password so those are the those are the three main things that are in at the core business domain of an authentication module. So these are the kind of things that you do look at and you do kind of uh, sit down and lay everything out um, before you sort of start creating your application. So here we have the Bcrypt service. So we import the password service um, and then we create our um, service because this is actually uh, a service that is in relation to data. It was in the in the data field. And then, um, so we pass our salt rounds into our constructor because we are going to use that. So here we hash, and then uh, we hash using salt rounds, and then we compare the hash. And um, in our domain, so here we have, yeah, we already did this. And here we have created our user domain. So this is just a read-only form of our user. And here we have our entry points. Now, this is the entry point for our application. So where all our queries get processed before they move to other places in our application. So here we have the auth controller, export default class, the auth controller. So this is the, the authentication controller, which has a sign-in controller, the sign-up controller, and the sign-out controller. And the sign-out controller is, uh, now we have helpers here. We have our logger helper. And we have our, it needs it needs some few, I'm gonna work on it. So let's just customize that. Uh, yeah, it needs a few, there was, some er there was some errors when I was testing it out, but by the time we're working on this, everything is gonna be perfect. So we have our token validator class, um, which is a helper. Its work is just to validate whether the token is really a JSON web token or not. And if you did log in to our application, we do invalidate your token, so that, that token can never be used again with Redis. And um, here we have our sign, our sign in validation rules, and our sign out validation rules. Normally, these things are usually put in the controller or in the router, and the router is not supposed to have uh, a lot of information, such kind of information. So we did uh, separate that because this is a helper, and we have our services here. So we have our interfaces for password token store and token service and then now we have the use case now the use case is what now actually gets done so here we export our default class and we all we do all that and then here we 
let me let me let me show you um how everything gets tied out yeah yeah so this is the main application that um i was working on and so this is the auth module that i did once and i do always create it every time so after all these use cases after the sign-in use case whereby we know our sign-in use case um has uh you can sign in um, with your name and email. So uh, execute is just gonna check if the email, if the type of, if the authentication type is email, then use the email login and use check for the email and password. So the email login just takes the password and, and uh, email. While the async, the OAuth login takes the name, the email and the type. So whether you're logging in with Google or with Twitter or with GitHub, we just need to know the type and whatever, authentication service you're gonna use you just need to get the api keys and just push it in and that's it and your application is just going to deal with all that so what at the end of the day we just what we're gonna store the user into our repository so we're just gonna wait for that user id and we're gonna check if the user exists in our database and if that doesn't work, so you can see the auth repository is the one that is in charge of doing the database queries and we are not handling any of that. So the repository such sort of serves its purpose, whereby the purpose of the repository is to be the repository. So to work all those um, important uh, things like database queries. And um, so the sign out use case. So what we do is we just pass in the iToken store and we just uh, check um, whether the token store was saved and then we just sign you out and mind you this is an api so none of that front-end stuff and so here's a sign up use case and so what we just do is we execute uh we just check the user we find if there's an email we catch the error if there's no error just return null um if there's no user um if there's a user who exists uh we just return a user exists and uh, hash the password and you can see this the password service. So we're actually doing with a lot of classes here. We're not handling any information that doesn't need to be asked because you would find on applications that this is where the password is hashed and that isn't supposed to be the case. So the sign up use case doesn't need to know whether the password is gonna be hashed. It just knows to bring a user in, pass, them, pass the password to a class, return the hashed uh, password and then add the user to, to uh, the database. So here we return the user ID which is the whole user. Um, and in our application, we just create a simple uh, application. But what we need to do is we need to compose now our application because now our application had dependencies. So I think you can see here, we didn't import um, anything to do with, I don't know, Express or uh, Bcrypt or um, none of that cool stuff. So all this should be code that can be plot, can be language can be written in any language so whether i am a c c developer or a scale scalar developer i should just be able to come and know that you're creating an interface that's supposed to hash and compare and it takes in a password and returns in a string so that could be the jwt token and it compares and returns a promise true or false and that is essentially what domain driven design helps us to achieve code that can be written in one language but can be understood by developers from all domains. And so when we're composing our application, so here is where we're gonna, this is where now all the neat stuff comes in. So you can see here we import our auth repository and we import our JWT token, our Redis, our token validator and all other routes now here that are not uh, part of our application like the restaurant router. And so here now we compose, we bring in our mongoose and Redis and we configure. Now, what does configure mean? Here is where now we check if we are in production and we pass the um, the URL. So in this case, we're using Heroku and we connect to the Redis instance um, using the Redis client and we connect to the Mongoose. So here we have a condition to connect to um, Redis client on what port or in regards to whether we're in production or development. And so here, um, we use the connection string to encode, we encode the MongoDB URI and we pass that um, in our client connect. So composition root client. 
Yep. So this is a uh, we return this dot client. So client is mongoose. Yeah. And then um, we connect and now we have our database connection. So whenever we pass in um, our application, first we configure, then we set up our auth router. So what does our auth router need? So first we bring in the repository and pass in the client. Because remember our auth repository takes in a mongoose client. So you can remember here in our constructor, we need to pass in the mongoose client because here's where we're gonna check the model and we're gonna uh, find and we're gonna uh, do all that neat stuff in the database. And so here again, we take the token service and then we pass the private key to the token service because the token key needs to encode, uh, I would say, it needs a, a, a key to code all the, um, what's it called, um, JWT token service. So here's all the neat, neat stuff on JWT happens. Let me just delete this. It's not supposed to be here. Yeah, and save that. And um, here we have the password service and we just and hash the password. We don't need anything there. And we have the token store here. So the Redis token store, which needs the Redis client passed to it. Yeah, you can see so that we can create, we can set the token and we can invalidate the token. Um, yeah, and yeah, and then here we have the token validator. And so the token validator needs the token service and the token store. So after setting up the, no, where is it? After setting up the connection to the, uh, Redis client, we just, we now need to validate the token. So we just need the token service and we need the token store. So the service being the JWT token to create the keys and save them and, and uh, the, the, the store to save them and the validator to check whether they exist and validate and invalidate. Um, mm -hmm. And so here we return and we, con we configure all this. And when we pass in now in our application, when we call all these functions in our simple, it's just a simple um, app.js. And here is now where we use our middleware. So we just use app.use, app auth, and we composition the root, configure our authentication router. So I think it's gonna be an interesting application. We're gonna use so many class-based um, functions, considering that we use a lot of function-based um, in for example, let me just show you uh, some code I wrote a while back. Um, it was just a project I wanted to do on my own. So, so it was a self-learning project, but it quickly spun out of control because um, as you are just going to see, it was just a lot of code. I couldn't understand what was going where, um, what needed to be advanced because everything was just a simple MVC application. I tried doing services so that I can understand what is going on but it just wasn't possible. You see, I'm just exporting a function which does this, and we just read somewhere that abstraction, we should depend on abstraction instead of concretion. So we shouldn't be able, we should not be, our application should not be able to depend on such a function. Rather, it should call a, a class with that function. So for example, our friends um, function should be a class for friends where we can have maybe, um, so you can see here my login service, is quite confusing. So it's just request body password and check that and we authenticate you with password passport and we return a request response. And that was, compared this to this, I would say this one took me a lot of time to think about, but this, I would use this kind of code anywhere in any other language um, that I would want to and I would use object oriented principles. So if it was Python, I would just go to Python and just implement the same thing all over again, just even as a simple Python application with just simple classes. And so thank you guys for joining me. I'm so sorry I've taken up four minutes of your time, but um, I'm so happy you guys uh, made time. This recording is going to be on YouTube, but this essentially is going to be the first of many meetings that we're gonna do um, in this series of domain driven design next week, I challenged a friend of mine called Felix so we can do some live coding. So we're going to work on an image uploader. So we're going to use Angular and Node.js and he's going to start up with the Node.js API and I'm going to start up with the front end and we are going to do um, uploads to your application to, to your local host. Then we are going to do uploads to a server on the Azure Blob storage. I can't wait to see you guys there. It's going to be an amazing session. And um, let me just give you guys an overview of our session. So today is the 20th of July, 2021. We had a high level overview of software design principles. 
it's gonna be happening every fortnight on august the 4th of august 2021 we're gonna start laying the groundwork for our authentication api we're gonna start writing some code while we're still talking back and i mean not talking back referring back to the presentation that we have today and so many um principles and books that i'm gonna have and share um so don't forget to read a clean architecture domain driven design i know you can't read all of it be sure to go through the paper by uncle bob i have the recommendation uh, and the links at the end i'm going to share with this um to everyone and um after laying the groundwork for our api so here we're going to just do everything that's going to be required then at the 18th of august while we're still working on our application we're going to be referring back to our presentation while testing out our application oh did i mention we're going to write tests we're going to talk about test driven development just after we have finished our laying the groundwork for our API. So we are gonna do test driven development and see whether our application is doing what it's going, what it's supposed to be doing. And on the 2nd of September, we're gonna finalize the series, deploy our app to Azure from GitHub and possibly even get someone to help us containerize our application. So you can always have a running instance of authentication module whereby you can just rent users because you're gonna be hosting. So you can rent users, all your clients, to be using that authentication module that you are the one who is going to be maintaining. Um, thank you guys for joining. Um, here are the references. So there was a clean blog on Free Code Camp, and this is the design principle um, paper, um, the solid principle paper written by Uncle Bob. You should really give this a read. It's a 34 paper read. It's a good book. There's a domain driven design book by Eric Evans and another one by, I think his name is Vaughn Vance and those are two great books i would really advise you to read clean architecture by robert c martins famously known as uncle bob whose credit by the way is this this picture i'm not the one who created this picture it's uncle bob and um yeah he has a blog called blog.cleancoder.com so he writes about writing clean code and he has so much and you can see this was detailed back in 2012 that can help you um, up your game as a software developer. So um, with that, thank you for joining me. My name is Ndirangu Seras Kishuki, and I'm going to just lay the ground to any questions. Can you share the link to the slides in the, in the chat? Yes, yes. This, the, let me just do that right now. The slides are going to be available to everyone. Um, Yeah. Um, let me just share. Apologies, I know you know you cannot get that link, but here is the here's the link for sharing. Yeah, so I think you can be able to access this link. Let me see if you can access it in an incognito. So you need to sign in. Um, I think you can be able to access that. Um, if you will not be able to sign in, I'm gonna be here. Um, Bethany is gonna be here. We are gonna share it to the, you can be able to comment on the meetup. So we are gonna share it to everyone who is who was in the meeting or who RSVP'd. And with that, um, I'm gonna say thank you to everyone who joined. I'm very sorry that uh, our meeting room changed. So just as I said, we had created a room, but it was in the wrong, I would say group, but now this is the room that we are going to be using for all our meetings and all web development related meetings. Next week, it was going to be hidden until the end of this meeting. We're going to work with Felix. So Felix is a goal, Microsoft Land student ambassador, just like Bethany, who is in our call, Bethany, hi. And so Felix is going to help us to create um, an API Node.js that we can be using to upload photos. And I'm going to write the front end in Angular, and it's going to be one complete I, I can't wait to see all you guys there. So is there any question? Uh, yeah, there is Bethany. She said hi. If, if there's any question, please hit me with it. And yeah, I'm going to be here. If not, um, I'm going to conclude the meeting in a few minutes. Um, I think in the next one minute. Feel free to unmute your mic and share something if you have uh, something to share. Okay, um, I think that's nice. I hope everyone understood. Um, 
next week we're gonna start um the coding so um i can see there's something here it was a great session thank you so much brian brian was our first guy here we're gonna work on getting swags because you definitely deserve swags and um yeah without that with all that said um thank you guys um i'll see you guys um after two weeks but next week we are after two weeks is when you're gonna go back to our domain driven design topic but next week you're gonna be diving into azure and angular so just creating a simple photo upload application with azure blob storage thank you guys and uh, this there's another message here can you grant access to this email how um Bethany, can I can we download this and and upload it to? How can yeah, I? Yeah, I'm you asking. Yeah. Yeah. You can go share. To share. Yeah. Up on your top right. Mhm. Mm then oh, oh. change link. Yeah. Can you confirm no, no, that you get there. to see the presentation? No, no, no. I don't think there will be. You see, under okay. get link, there's restricted only people. No, no. no. Is, it, is it that? No. Under get link. On your right, change anyone with link. Yeah. Then you can now share from there. Okay, um, Hilo, please confirm you can be able to see the um, the, the 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 slides. So uh, we're gonna send this to your emails either way. And with that, let me stop recording. We've passed the one minute mark. <laughs>